afternoon. I'm Anush Mehrotra, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this episode of George Talks Business. Today, our focus is on artificial intelligence, and I'm going to be delighted to in, in, in introduce our guest today. But before that, let me introduce my colleague from the Dean of George Washington School of Engineering and Applied Science, John Locke, who is going to be co-hosting this with me today. John, thanks for the partnership and welcome. Thanks so much for including me, Anuj. It's always a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our honored guest, Natasha Crampton, Chief Responsible AI Officer at Microsoft. Thank you for being here today, Natasha. Thanks so much for having me. Wonderful. And with this, let me let John get it started. Thanks, Anuj. Um, Natasha, it's great to have you here. And, and, and can, we, can we start by with you giving us an overview of your role and, and telling us a bit about what led Microsoft to create the position of Chief Responsible AI Officer to begin with? I, I'd also be interested in hearing an example or two of, of what you're trying to accomplish in this role or maybe what you were trying to prevent. Absolutely. So my job in a nutshell involves putting Microsoft's AI principles to work across the company. And in practice, that involves things like defining uh, the rules that uh, teams need to follow when they're building AI systems across the company. We need to organize training. We need to ensure that the highest impact use cases have the right type of oversight um, of them. But I think stepping back from my specific role is an interesting thing to think about why these sorts of roles are emerging across the industry. It's not just Microsoft who's establishing uh, roles such as mine. And I think it's really, it comes down to two key factors. So the first uh, that I like to point to is the fact that you know, AI technologies are incredibly transformative. We really know that these technologies have the potential to solve some of the world's biggest challenges. So you can think about things like climate change or um, making available more equitable or effective healthcare. But this technology really cannot achieve its potential unless people trust us. And we know that in order for people to trust the technology, we really need to put in place guardrails um, to make sure that the benefits are secured and the harms of the technology when it meets society are identified and mitigated. And I think there's a particular need for this type of role when it comes to building AI technology. So I think as some of the audience would have um, discovered themselves in, in their own uh, learning, you know, AI systems are quite different from traditional software um, development uh, and, and the resulting systems. Um, and that's because we really need to think not just about the technical uh, composition of the system, but we need to think about the socio-technical dimensions of the system. And so there, what I'm really saying is that we need to think about where the technology meet society and how the power of these technologies can really change the way in which humans and, and AI systems interact with one another. So we've got this whole new set of new socio-technical issues, and that means we need new processes and practices and tools to guide this type of work. Uh, so that's really what my job is. I think it's, it's definitely a combination of art and science. But what I'm really trying to do at the company is build this culture and this practice of responsible AI. So that's great, Natasha. Let me follow up, if I may, on this question. You mentioned how this uh, technology is so transformative. So perhaps uh, if you could give us um, some of the cutting edge examples of uh, AI use at Microsoft, what is it achieving? And perhaps some of the breakthrough technologies that we will be seeing in the future. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's it's been interesting thinking about um, the development and deployment of technology over even this last 18 months as the world has been grappling with the pandemic. On the one hand, you might have expected the pandemic to slow down this activity, but what we've actually seen is it's, it's sped up both in the advances in the technology as well as the actual use case deployments of those technologies as well. So we think about the technology itself, you know, in, in 2021, we now have sort of generative everything. You know, the technology is 
very good at uh, AI systems can compose text and audio and images in to a very high standard. And we've seen these really big advances in natural language processing systems. So you might have heard, for example, of GPT-3, a technology developed by OpenAI, as well as in, in technologies like computer vision. And I think while these technological developments are really impressive, when we start seeing them applied to real use cases, this is where we can really start to get excited about the potential of them. So one example of that that I thought might be interesting for this uh, audience is um, GitHub's Copilot. Um, so this is um, a tool that we have made available recently. And what it does is it converts natural language into code. So a developer can ask the tool in plain English um, to prepare code that helps to format shipping addresses for when you're buying something online, for example. And the tool returns that code. Um, and so what you're seeing here is instead of, you know, developers spending hours reading API docs for uh, coding languages that they're not familiar with, or maybe searching on Stack Overflow to find examples of, of code that they might uh, need to use for their task. GitHub's Copilot tool is actually generating that code for developers, allowing those developers to kind of put their skills to you know, the harder problems that are encountered um, when you are developing a piece of software. And I think you know, this is still a very early stage technology. I think there's a lot of potential for it going forward. But in, in, uh, you know, sort of thinking about what the real world impact of this type of technology is, you know, I think one of our OpenAI colleagues put it really well when they said that, you know, trying to code in an unfamiliar language by Googling everything is like navigating a foreign country with a phrase book. Using GitHub Copilot is like hiring an interpreter. So I think that's a really um, nice, tangible way to um, think about the sort of potential of this type of technology. You know, of course, you know, we're continuing to see leaps and bounds in other forms of uh, technology as well. Just one example from this week is that, you know, our translation technology, which is um, you know, helping to power very many of the office products or even internet search is now available in more than 100 languages, which is a really exciting milestone. And it means that we can make text accessible um, and information accessible to, you know, huge numbers of people around the world. So I think, you know, we've got this situation now where we've got rapid advances in the technology, and we're also starting to apply that technology to some of the, you know, most urgent challenges that we have as a society, whether that's climate change or in healthcare. And I think that, so we're at a pretty exciting uh, inflection point. That, that, that is really exciting. Uh, that's, that's, it sounds like fantastic progress. Um, you mentioned earlier about some of the socio-technical challenges that come up with these kinds of technologies. And in one of our previous sessions in the George Talks business series on AI, Anuj and I uh, had a great conversation with Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee at the Brookings Institution. And, and we talked about the issues of accuracy and fairness in AI, as well as digital equity and equality in the broader tech space. And could you talk a little bit about Microsoft's key responsible AI principles and, and its approach to building a trustworthy AI? Absolutely. So at the company, we have a set of six principles that really serve as our North Star for this effort. And we adopted those principles back in January 2018. Um, and those six principles are fairness, reliability and safety, privacy and security, inclusiveness, transparency and accountability. So let me bring them to life a little bit for everyone by giving you a couple of examples. I mean, it's critically important, as you would have heard about from Dr. Turner Lee, that we build uh, AI technology that serves people fairly and treats people fairly. Um, but that's actually much easier said than done because you know, it's very easy for AI technology to amplify societal uh, biases. It's very easy for AI systems to um, 
be acted on by humans in ways that are unfair. And so we really have to take a very diligent approach to identifying and mitigating fairness harms throughout the life cycle of building um, an AI system, right? It's not going to serve the world well if we have AI systems that don't recognize certain accents. We do not want to perpetuate uh, certain uh, 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 demographic differences in job um, and employment statistics just because that's how it worked in the past. So when it comes to fairness, we've really got to think about how do we avoid exacerbating and amplifying past societal biases and bringing those into the future and potentially in ways that amplify them. So fairness is critically important. When we think about reliability and safety, also privacy and security, I think you can think about these principles as um, establishing the necessary safeguards that we've seen with other types of technological revolutions, right? With, the, with automobiles, for example, came new road rules and new liability laws. We need new um, regimes to address reliability and safety in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to know that AI systems are going to behave as we expect them to in predictable conditions, but also unpredictable conditions as well. Um, with privacy and security, I mean, I think with our digital lives now, we really understand the importance of making sure that we design for privacy and security from the outset. And that's really what we're focused on there. When it comes to inclusiveness, I think, you know, we feel strongly that we need to build systems that distribute the benefits of that technology as broadly as possible. And that really means designing for everyone of all walks of life and of all abilities as well. Um, you know, I think Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft, really puts it well when you think about the opportunity that there is in this space for um, more inclusive technologies. If, with the perception capabilities of AI, if a computer can hear, imagine what that means for a person who's blind. And if a computer can see, imagine what that means for a person who is blind. So I think it's about including uh, everyone from all walks of life and really making sure that the systems are designed for the full human experience. We really think of transparency and accountability, those final two principles, as foundational. And by that, what I mean is that they're really important principles because um, they are essential to uphold in their own right, but they also enable fairness and reliability and safety and some of those other principles that I spoke about earlier. So with transparency, you know, human beings need to be able to understand why a system is outputting the output that it is. If I'm a bank and I am using an AI system in the course of a loan application process, I need to understand why it's giving me that recommendation, that prediction. It's suggesting I make that decision. We need to apply human oversight and thought to those sorts of uh, predictions or recommendations. Equally, if I'm the banking customer, I need to know what's happened there. There's a black box algorithm that doesn't serve anyone well, especially if you might need to challenge a decision. So that type of transparency is really important. But we also think about transparency in other dimensions as well. I mean, human beings don't want to be duped into believing that they're interacting with a human being when in fact they're interacting with an AI system. So sometimes there's an important level of transparency around the fact that you are interacting with an AI-powered chatbot and not a human being. Finally, on accountability, you know, we just need to be very sure and consistently focused on the fact that humans who are making the design and development decisions are remaining accountable for them. We need people doing embracing practices like impact assessments at the outset. We need oversight of really high impact cases. We need to make sure that you know, AI technology is being matched to the right use cases, right? All technologies have capabilities and limitations. How do we make sure that there's the right type of matching between the capabilities of the tech and the particular use case to which it's been applied? So those are our six principles. They infuse uh, everything that we do in terms of developing and making available our technology. 
And a lot of my job on a day-to-day -day basis is actually taking a double click down on what all of those principles mean and designing practices and processes to help make those uh, real at scale. So that's uh, really some some uh, great principles, of course, to be building AI systems on. And, and you mentioned so many challenges as a society. I think just even the design of AI systems is also going to be a, presenting a challenge to the society. Let me delve a little bit deeper into, for example, um, the fairness, um, uh, you know, principle that you're talking about. And, and of course, there is all this bias that exists within AI driven uh, decision making, for example, would love to hear how do you operationalize this fairness principle that you're talking about? It's one thing to have the thought process behind as to what that is, but how do you operationalize it? And then perhaps um, from the bias perspective, uh, is it really uh, important to have a diverse set of people um, designing and building these AI systems to reduce such biases? It's a great question, and I'm so pleased you asked it because I really do believe that fairness and operationalizing fairness uh, type principles is really one of the most urgent and also one of the most complex uh, questions that we're facing in responsible AI practice today. I think we've got to start by acknowledging that as humans, we are biased and that bias can show up in training data, it can show up in the choices that we make about how we build the models, it can show up in the way that we act on the output of AI systems that we might develop. You overlay that with the fact that you know results in a lab for any type of testing don't necessarily reflect results in the real world. And societal um, expectations are also continually evolving. So this is another dimension that you have to accommodate for when you're designing processes to operationalize uh, your fairness principle. There's also no single definition of fairness that is appropriate in all circumstances. And so there is actually a process of making some very sort of conscious trade-offs um, and seldom in my experience are there actually clear cut answers that need to be, uh, that can be found. And so this is how we do it at Microsoft. And it's the product I will say of uh, lots of debate and discussion uh, not just within my team, but we're fortunate to have some of uh, the world's leading thinkers of, on fairness topics at Microsoft Research, and we really do work shoulder to shoulder on these topics. So the first thing that we do is we've identified three types of fairness harms that uh, we think is essential for Microsoft to focus on in upholding the fairness uh, principle. The first is the quality of service harm. So here, what we're thinking about is, we think it's really important to have a world where um, as much as possible, we try and have the technology performing to the same level for the different demographic groups that it is uh, targeted towards. And that absolutely includes marginalized groups. As I mentioned earlier, we don't want technology that doesn't recognize a certain type of accent. We don't want facial recognition technology that uh, classifies gender really well for white men and really poorly for black women. That's not acceptable. So this is a type of harm that we focus on and we essentially follow a pattern where we have our, our teams think about who are the stakeholders for this system? What are their demographic groups? How could performance vary across those demographic groups? And then we ask them to test for that and then identify any gaps, mitigate those gaps as best as they can, and then think about what information might need to be disclosed to our customers so that they're aware of the capabilities of the technology, but also the limitations, which is really important. The second type of harm that we're focused on is what we call an allocation harm. So here we're thinking about making sure that resources and opportunities are equitably distributed. Some people in the audience might have heard of a recent situation, for example, where a healthcare algorithm that was designed to try and make sure that people were getting the right uh, future healthcare turned out to be biased against black people because rather than um, uh, be modeled on valid indicators of future health needs, 
it turned out being that it was modelled on uh, the amount of money spent on healthcare, which of course um, is a, a poor uh, choice of uh, feature to model on because of the fact that we know that uh, historically uh, there have been some uh, systemic issues which have meant that uh, black people in certain parts of the country have been unable to spend the same amount of money on healthcare. So that just led to an inequitable outcome. So we think about those types of harms as well. And again, it is a process of sort of identifying how those sorts of harms might show up, measuring for them, mitigating them, and then disclosing where gaps may remain um, and making decisions about whether it's uh, the system is still uh, a valid one without that. The final type of harm that we're concerned about is something that we call representational harm. So this is thinking about really more complex concepts around stereotyping and erasure and avoiding uh, denigration of certain groups. Now, it, to give you a practical example of this, this would be a scenario where, for example, you do an image search online and you search for a CEO and the image results just return male CEOs. Or you are doing a translation exercise from a gender neutral language and the translation assumes a certain gender that she is a nurse, he is a doctor, when in fact the originating language was gender neutral. This particular type of harm, I would say, is one of the most complex types of harm. That is really an important one to keep researching and understanding more so that we can develop mitigations over time. So this is, you know, as I say, I think a really critically important part of the practice of responsible AI. Um, we're never going to be in a situation where we can completely debias a system or guarantee fairness, but I really do think this is an effort that companies and academia, uh, governments should really lock arms on and, and do as much as we can together because it's just so critical to the fair and responsible functioning of these systems. I agree. It's it, it's such important work. Uh, and and I, I thank you for your leadership in this area. It's it's it's, it's really critical, I think. Um, you know, so speaking of intentional harm, we, we actually had um, a great question that was submitted from our student, Al Mustafa, who was asking if you could talk a little bit about the future uh, for detection and defense against deep fake videos, uh, which certainly can be used in, in that intentional harm that you were describing earlier. I, I think that's a great example of a situation where without the right types of controls, you can end up in a situation where there's a significant erosion of, of trust um, if you have deep fake videos proliferating without uh, any uh, any ability to discern what is uh, in fact the case and what appears to be the case. Now, I think this is a bit of a grand challenge area in the space of responsible AI as well. I think the research that we've discussed within the company suggests that um, while detection is important, um, it can be a bit of a, a cat and mouse game um, in that just as soon as you detect uh, a particular technique, uh, there's efforts by those who are sort of adversarially minded um, to develop new techniques that get around those de detection approaches. So I think the direction of travel that um, Dr. Eric Krovitz, uh, who is our chief scientific officer, um, has really been pursuing here in partnership with organizations like the BBC is really thinking about what would good provenance controls look like in this space? And so I think there's some early work there that shows promise, but I would say it's it's definitely an area that we need to uh, invest in further. Great. So, you know, you talked about transparency as well. So let me insert a question from one of our viewers, Ellie, who's asking, how can AI systems be transparent without really revealing proprietary intellectual property? So does abstracting the algorithm lead to lesser transparency? I think that's a, a very valid question and one that's really on the minds of a lot of policy makers. What we've found when we've double clicked down on effective means of transparency is that when you start breaking down the stakeholders for a system and you think about what their needs are, it's, it's not always the case, and I would argue it's 
often not the case that handing over uh, the whole uh, model and its training data is an effective way to provide those stakeholders with the information that they need in order to perform their roles. What we've found is that, you know, there's some really, I think, exciting um, emerging uh, techniques uh, that uh, have been developed at, at Microsoft and at very many other academic ins institutions around the world where we can provide different types of transparency to different types of stakeholders that are actually effective in meeting their needs. So for example, we have um, an open source package that has been developed by some of our researchers here um, that's called Interpret ML. And in that, um, the community can access a variety of different approaches to providing uh, intelligibility of models and sometimes People need that intelligibility in order to make sure that they are making valid decisions. Sometimes people need the intelligibility in order to actually uh, identify bugs in the operation of their system. Sometimes people need it simply just to be able to build trust in the technology and communicate what the purpose of it is. So I think, you know, there are valid concerns about making, and sometimes are in the nature of national security concerns about making available um, all of the, you know, the training data, all of the models. Um, but so I think it's really, it's not a, a sort of binary decision that needs to be made there. It's a much more fine grained analysis of given these transparency needs, how can we best solve for them in a way that's actually effective for uh, the particular stakeholder that's looking to uh, have have their transparency needs, needs met? Interesting. You, you know, it's uh, just listening to you talk about some of the examples and some of the challenges around here. You know, I, 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 I often think that you know, we as a society are often being very reactive to responsibility crises that that emerge around technology. And I, I what I hear you describing is a by applying these principles, uh, we can be more you know proactive and help prevent such crises from occurring. Is it is this a big part of what you're focusing on? It is, and I think we're trying to build the muscle of that foresight um, and the muscle of developing a system with a full understanding of its uh, its benefits, but also its harms and the way in which things can go wrong in mind from the beginning. So one of the steps that we take internally to try and help uh, make that sort of commitment real is that we ask teams that are building new AI systems to undertake impact assessments. Um, of the system uh, very early in the envisioning process. So this is right when we have the idea that let's, you know, let's build this AI powered feature, let's build this type of system. And what we've done over time, and we've had several versions of this uh, impact assessment at this point, is that we, we try to guide teams through the process of identifying the purpose of the system. What is the problem that they are trying to solve? Um, who are the stakeholders for the system? And we're not just thinking about, you know, Microsoft's customer that's going to be buying the system from us. We're thinking about who are the people who are impacted by the system, maybe even involuntarily. Um, are, there, are there bystanders? Are there marginalised communities that we need to identify from the very outset who have special needs and considerations that we need to think about from the very beginning? Then we go through a guided process of helping teams think about what are those benefits of the technology and how can we secure them, but also what are the harms and how can we mitigate them? So I think this process of having that deep reflection at the beginning of the project is critically important. And what I've noticed over time is that um, the group of people coming together to have that reflection is so important. So Dean Marotra earlier referred to you know, a question about the importance of having a diverse group of people working on these technologies. I cannot emphasize how important that is, particularly when you're at this early envisioning stage of thinking about the impact of that system on the world and then following through on all the mitigations after that. We've found that, you know, 
in addition to a diverse range of backgrounds, it's really important to have a diverse range of disciplines. So, you know, we might have a software developer with a data scientist, with a, a product manager, but also critically a user researcher, a designer, a person who might be their frontline attorney. So it's thinking about all of these different perspectives at the beginning just really increases uh, the odds that the team has a really good understanding of what they're building um, and is able to design a system effectively to harness those benefits, but also anticipate and mitigate the harms. So, uh, Natasha, this is so uh, interesting what, you're, what we are talking about, and I know we can go on forever, uh, but I do want to get a couple more questions. I know I want to respect your time and I appreciate it, but uh, I do want to get into the regulation part of it. I mean, how, uh, you know, some of the policy and regulation that is that is around AI, and in particular, let me jump to a question and connect it with the political tension. So, Teresa, for example, is asking, if you see political tensions getting in the way, to providing some practical solutions to the ongoing and sometimes hidden challenges of deploying AI technologies and its impact on people? That's a really insightful question, I think. And the way we think about it uh, at Microsoft is that there are some enduring values, including the company's commitment to human rights, that must always rise above those types of political challenges. But it is a really interesting time in that sort of AI policy making space because we've moved from a situation where for a long time we had lots of principles and national AI strategies and some specific regulation on specific technologies. So uh, you might have read about various facial recognition pieces of legislation being passed in, here in the US, including bans and moratoria in, in certain jurisdictions, as well as some more specific regulation uh, that was passed here in Washington state. So we've seen these pieces in the landscape for a while now, but what's also been overlaid now are some more comprehensive approaches to regulating the technology. And so actually the first proposal that we've seen here has come out of Europe. They have the proposed European Artificial Intelligence Act. And it raises some really interesting questions and hard questions about how you regulate um, not actually the technology, but the uses of the technology. And there are some tough questions that the commission had to ask and answer in developing that proposal. Is this more like privacy regulation? Should we regulate this like, should we offer up people new rights, like uh, rights that might be embodied in the constitution or in Europe in the Charter of Fundamental Rights? Or is this more like product safety and we should regulate it that way? In the end, the US has chosen to go down, uh, sorry, the European Union has chosen to go down a path of, of product safety as a sort of baseline with some adaptations for the AI world. And we've seen some early signs here in the US that maybe different approaches will be taken. So just last week, uh, at OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, announced that they're developing an AI Bill of Rights, which is a, a rights-based approach to regulating uh, this, this technology. And while that Bill of Rights itself is not a regulatory measure, I have no doubt that it will influence the direction of travel here. So I think it's, it's a really fascinating time. I do think there is an essential role for regulation in building trust. I mean, absolutely, companies like Microsoft should exercise self-restraint and adopt programs like the one that I lead. Um, but that is not going to be enough. And I think it's just so the benefits of this technology are so great. And also the harms can be very costly that we just need to establish this baseline of law so that uh, everyone has protection under uh, the law and not just those who choose to buy from companies that uh, implement this type of program themselves. Absolutely. Well, um, switching gears a little bit again, uh, just, you know, you're talking about that future and where, where all of this is heading. I, I'd love to hear about how you see AI as changing uh, the future of learning and the future of work. Um, and in particular, you know, what kinds of, of, of skills will, will be in demand in the future? And, and 
and from our students' perspective uh, in the audience here, you know, what, what guidance and advice do you have for them to best prepare for that future? And also, what advice do you have for my colleague Anuj and, and, and me and, and our, our fellow faculty about what we can do in higher education to prepare the next generation of, of tech leaders, especially to be responsible in their development and use of AI? Well, I think uh, multidisciplinary work is the way of the future. And I think that's something that's uh, borne out by this conversation here between the deans of the School of Business and the School of Engineering. But it's very much borne out by the work that I do across the company. I'm, I'm an attorney by training. And uh, every day of every week, I am working with um, software developers, data scientists, social psychologists, philosophers, you name it. It's, there's a very broad range of interdisciplinary work that's really needed to understand those socio-technical issues that I discussed earlier. Um, so I think it's really important to embrace that type of work. And doing it effectively, I think, requires an ability to try and step into the shoes of, of your colleague and to develop a muscle for sort of translating across disciplines. You know, I find it interesting in some of these uh, conversations that we've had within the company that sometimes it's even just a question of the vocabulary that you use. And a researcher might be talking about, you know, uh, differences in demographic performance of a particular model. And if you talk to a software developer, if you say, look, there's a real problem with the quality of service of this particular uh, offering that we have, that's actually going to resonate a lot more than talking about differences in demographic performance. But these are the same, These <laughs> this vocabulary is getting at the same concept. So I think building that muscle of working well across disciplines, being able to translate across disciplines. And really, uh, I would say, trying to bring in and understand perspectives other than your own perspective. Um, and this, this really does go back to the diversity point uh, that we were talking about earlier, which is that it's very essential that we bring in all of the voices to make sure that we're having conversations with the breadth of society and not just some, some subset of it. I do think it's important to try and stay across the debate. I mean, these responsible AI issues are just turning up in the popular press every day now. Um, but I think at the academy, um, colleges and universities around the world really play a particularly important role here. I think uh, academics really help us see around those corners and find, uh, help us better understand how and why things may go wrong so that we can help design these systems well uh, from the outset. And I think finally, I would say that we need creative problem solvers in this space. And that's a message for the students, but I think it's also for the faculty. This is, I think, a really important skill to navigating these these hard problems at the intersection of technology and society. Um, the answers on uh, many of these topics are not likely to be obvious. And I think I've also formed the view that durable solutions in this space are unlikely to be at the extremes as well. We need to start thinking you know, really hard about things like the definition of the problem to be solved, um, what are those capabilities and limitations of the technology? And, you know, I think fundamentally being grounded in that human experience. Um, and sometimes we're going to have to have the courage to make hard calls. If we can't secure benefits and the harms are too costly, then we shouldn't be proceeding with those sorts of systems. And I think that in itself is a, a skill uh, that we need to build as well. So all in all, I would say uh, this work is you know, absolutely in my case, been some of the hardest work of my professional career, but also the most deeply satisfying. So I, I do hope that uh, some of the students listening on this call are is sort of inspired to join us on this journey. We're still at the very early stages of it. And uh, anyone who uh, can get on board and think about uh, developing AI systems with humans and human rights at the center of them, I think will do really well in this space. 
Well, thank you, Natasha, for this fascinating conversation. I know we, based on your last answer, I think both John and I would agree that we are preparing our students well. So Microsoft should be looking at our students, both in engineering school and business school, very carefully. And they are very <laughs> excited about that. Uh, and, 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 I, and, 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 and I thank you also for staying perhaps longer than what you had bargained for when you came on the show. And uh, so, again, thank you very much. And thank you, John, for co-hosting this session. And hopefully, we'll have more of these discussions on these very important and timely topics. So thank you again. I would also like to thank all of you who have joined us today and invite you to the next episode of George Talks Business. Please do note that our schedule has changed a little bit. Our next guest will be Roger Dow, President and CEO of the U.S. Travel Association, who will be interviewed by Professor Selene Matus, Executive Director of the International Institute of Tourism Studies at our School of Business. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time.